Today, I will be talking about Usabunum v. Prashuski, a Supreme Court case which considers whether nominal damages can be disputed if unconstitutional policies are revised during a lawsuit. The case goes back to 2016 when Chike Usabunum, a student at Georgia Gwinnett College, was stopped from distributing religious literature and sharing his faith on campus. Citing the school's speech zone policy, officials informed Uzubunum he needed to reserve a spot in one of two free speech zones to speak publicly about his beliefs. Uzubunum obtained a reservation, but officials stopped him once again, claiming he caused disorderly conduct. Their actions prompted Joseph Bradford, a friend of Uzubunum's, to abandon his plans to speak at the event. Uzubunum and Bradford sued the college, claiming school policies violated the First and Fourteenth Amendments. They sued for a declaration that the speech code was unconstitutional and for nominal damages, amounts of typically $1 or $2 awarded when the plaintiff is in the right but has not suffered a measurable loss. These are injuries like a violation of speech, where there is clear damage, but the damage is difficult to quantify, and these are different from compensatory damages, which cover quantifiable loss like car damages from a freeway accident. During this time, administrators of Georgia Gwinnett College, including President Stanley Prashewski, voided the challenge policies and then filed to dismiss the case. The students countered, arguing their case could still continue on nominal damages claims alone. In May 2018, the district court ruled for the college. It reasoned that nominal damages were not enough to allow the case to continue under the school's revised policies. The 11th Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed in July 2019, citing its controversial ruling in a 2017 case, Flanagan's Enters, Inc. v. City of Sandy, that nominal damages could not save otherwise moot cases, moot referring to cases where there is no live dispute. Uzabunim and Bradford appealed to the Supreme Court, which agreed to hear the case in July 2020. During oral arguments at the Supreme Court, the student's lawyer, Kristen Wagoner, argued that while Georgia Gwinnett College revised its policies, it needs to be held accountable for violating the student's rights. She held the only remedy is nominal damages, which are designed to redress, quote, injuries that transcend price tags. Wagoner asserted that the 11th Circuit's ruling in Flanagan's conflicts with centuries of English and American court rulings, which granted nominal damages even after defendants revised unconstitutional policies. Deputy Assistant Attorney General Hashim Mupin, who also argued on Uzabunam and Bradford's behalf, seconded her position. Pinson, the lawyer for Georgia Gwinnett College, held that without the threat of future injury, only cases that seek compensation should continue through courts. He argued nominal damages aren't compensation because they are of so little value. Also, Allowing plaintiffs to sue solely on nominal damages claims encourages unnecessary litigation. Pinson added that nominal damages suits can lead courts to incorrectly issue advisory opinions, non-binding opinions on the law, which may give people vindication, but aren't legal rulings. Chief Justice John Roberts asked the first question during oral arguments to Wagner. He questioned the legal standing of cases that only seek nominal damages. To have standing, or the right to sue, plaintiffs must demonstrate they suffered a concrete injury traceable to the defendant that is likely to be resolved by the court. However, Roberts pointed out, Georgia Gwinnett College already removed the portions of its speech code that the plaintiffs challenged. What more were the plaintiffs seeking than a declaration that they were right, symbolized by nominal damages? Wagner replied that under Article 3 of the Constitution, Injuries require redress, no matter how insignificant the amount of money awarded. Unlike declaratory judgments, which prevent future injury, nominal damages redress past injury, which the plaintiff sought. Meanwhile, Justice Breyer wondered how Joseph Bradford, who unlike Chike Uzabunam, wasn't stopped from speaking at the event, suffered a concrete injury. Wagner argued Bradford intended to speak but was discouraged from doing so after officials threatened Uzabunam with disciplinary action. His speech was chilled or prohibited because he feared suspension or expulsion if he carried out his intention to speak. 
Justice Gorsuch brought up the college's claim that requiring plaintiffs to sue for compensation and not just nominal damages would have little bearing on cases. For instance, Gorsuch pointed out students could sue for compensation for bus fare or the time it took to walk to campus. Wagner cautioned against this practice, which could encourage plaintiffs to make up damages, leading to prolonged litigation. In a question to Mupin, Justice Kagan questioned the relevance of past nominal damages cases. For instance, some decisions came before declaratory judgments existed. In others, courts dealt with damages that weren't quantified, but now have fixed monetary values. If nominal damages no longer play a role in these cases, in what ways are they still necessary today? In response, Mupin cited Justice Story, a 19th century Supreme Court justice who held every injury causes damage that must be redressed. Some cases are monetized, but for those in which damage isn't or can't be measured, nominal damages remain the appropriate recourse. Justice Kagan also had a question for Pinson, the lawyer for the college, concerning, quote, the most famous nominal damages case I know of in recent time. In this case, American singer and songwriter Taylor Swift sued a radio host for sexual assault. Swift sued for $1, not as compensation for her injury, but as an acknowledgement of harm. Under the college's logic, why couldn't she do that? Pinson argued that because Swift only sought nominal damages and there wasn't a clear likelihood of future harm, her case should have been moot. Instead, Swift should have alleged a compensable injury and received compensatory damages. Justice Kavanaugh mentioned Pinson's claim that if courts allow lawsuits relying solely on nominal damages, then people will experience prolonged litigation. However, couldn't a defendant avoid this problem simply by paying a dollar? Kavanaugh also noted that plaintiffs who only sue for nominal damages generally don't receive much money to pay for attorney's fees. Wouldn't this also discourage wasteful litigation? To summarize, the plaintiffs hold cases that only seek nominal damages are not moot, even if unconstitutional policies are revised during litigation. Past injuries need to be redressed, even if there is no threat of future harm. Nominal damages have a place for damages that are difficult to measure, like a violation of speech or an unreasonable search of one's home. Respondents contend nominal damages cases should not be allowed to continue if an unconstitutional issue was already resolved. Uzabunu and Bradford's lawsuit prompted officials to change their policies, and the issue should have been resolved there. Respondents argue allowing these cases to continue through courts would lead to drawn-out litigation. A ruling in the students' favor could affect the enforcement of not just school, but also government policies. The Supreme Court will release its decision sometime this year. So that's a summary of Uzabuna versus Prashewski. Thank you for watching.